Okay, great. So yeah, I'll just very quickly say I'm Susie Ziegler. I'm the head of the Department of Earth, Environmental and Geographical Sciences at Northern Michigan University. And we're delighted to be hosting a series of presentations to help us celebrate Earth Day. And um, I'm gonna have John, one of the students who helped organize this, introduce our two speakers and thank Kit also who's in the audience for helping to put this all together and helping with the advertising. So turn it over to you, John. All right, thanks Susie and thanks everybody for coming and especially to our two presenters tonight. So uh, we kind of designed this speaker series to inform the discussion around how does NMU reach carbon neutrality? And you know, there's, there's these three different scopes when you're trying to look at what is a carbon footprint and an institution has to take into account scope one, which is direct emissions from the burning of fossil fuels. So like when they're burning natural gas for heating and that, and then uh, scope two, they have to take into account, which is generally their purchased electricity. So we had um, for scope one, uh, a, a, demo, or a presentation on heat pumps and refrigerants and scope two, we had solar panel uh, topic covered. And then now for scope three, which um, they can choose or not to uh, include in their carbon footprint, we're talking about other emissions such as from food waste rotting in a landfill and, and turning into methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. And so this uh, presentation is to discuss options that, um, that are alternative to sending food waste to landfills and how that can benefit the university in any number of ways. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Aaron Yoki from uh, Partridge Creek Farm. He's the compost director there and they currently partner with NMU to recycle some of the kitchen scraps on campus. So um, take it away, Aaron, if you would. All right. Uh, do you want me to give a PowerPoint presentation or? Yeah, that, I think that'd be great. All right. You should, you should be able to share it. I have it set that you should be able to share it. All right. Um, let's see. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Sweet. I never did this before. This is pretty cool. <laughs> yep. We've got it there. If you can blow it up to the full screen um, presentation mode. All right. It's loading. Oh. Okay. Okay. Good. This, this presentation has a lot of pictures in it. So Partridge Creek Farm, you know, it's a community garden project. We have gardens around town and we work with a lot of students. And we have multiple garden sites around Ishpeman. Uh, growing together, we're providing access to locally grown produce and teaching children and students how to grow and prepare their own produce. Um, we make vermicompost. And we use it to fertilize our garden sites and sell to fund our community garden project and education programs. Vermi is Latin for worm. <laughs> Vermicompost is worm manure. Um, well, first step in our process, uh, because the food waste we pick up from the university and the restaurants is about 75% water, we mix it with the horse manure to bulk it up and create a more suitable worm bed and that manure is stockpiled in windrows. Next step is we collect carbon materials like leaves, hay, and cardboard and woody debris. Those are mulched over the windrows. The mulch is later mixed with the worm bed and helps to control the weeds and regulate temp and moisture. And it also keeps our rows warm over the winter. There's a loading dock at, I think, uh, Northern Center. And on average, I think we're picking about, per week right now, 200 gallons of food waste. I just got back like an hour ago from picking up the waste at Northern. We get grains from breweries and food waste from other restaurants too. Uh, the food waste is dumped and mixed with the carbon materials and the manure. 
and it starts to generate heat through thermophilic composting with the aerobic bacteria. And the step five, the curing process, this takes about nine months to a year. As the wind rows cool, the worms and fungi begin to colonize the rows. And after that nine months, the wind rows are, call, are, uh, are uh, consolidated to dry and any leftover anaerobic pockets are aerated and they disappear. But the picture on the left, you can see the long rows of Kieran compost under the hay and in the background under the tarps, that's where uh, the, the piles have been consolidated and that material will be later sifted. Um, we sift our vermicompost where you move rocks, uh, debris and worms from the finished product and the worms are returned back into the new windrows. And there's all the pile of bags that we fill. And how does composting decrease NMU campus emissions? Well, an organic waste is put in a landfill, it begins to break down anaerobically without the presence of oxygen and it produces methane. And when organic waste is composted with aerobic methods, the methane emission reduction is equivalent to one ton of C CO2 per ton of food waste. This is like an industry standard um, estimate. And, uh, and I know as a source for this, the Department of Environment of Australia put this figure out. That's what they've determined. Uh, vermicomposting also reduces emissions because it can be used as a fertilizer and it, it limits the overall demand of mine rock and chemical fertilizer. That is a pretty big industry that uses a lot of fossil fuels just for the mine and, and uh, chemical processing that needs to be done. How much food waste is collected? At least one ton of food waste is collected per week. 52 tons per year. And I'd say two thirds of that is coming from NMU. Uh, average automobile, automobile produces five tons of CO2 per year. And the methane reduction from compost and is equivalent to the CO2 emissions of uh, almost 10 and a half automobiles. More reasons of compost. Uh, not only does compost and decrease emissions, it keeps organic waste in a soil cycle. And the use of compost helps to rebuild depleted soil. I'd suggest if you can, stop throwing out your own food waste and um, make your own backyard compost or if you have the ability to do it. And, uh, it's like, uh, oh, and I like to thank the Department of Energy and Environment Great Lakes, uh, we just won a grant from them for a new truck and trailer, which is really helping us out. Uh, they requested we mention them in any presentations we give. <laughs> and uh, we're also a member of the Michigan Recycling Coalition, and I've gone to their conference for. Um, obviously, right now, there isn't really any conferences happening, it's all virtual. And that is it for this PowerPoint. Well, thanks a lot, Aaron. That was great. I, it, it's, those were excellent visuals to get a better idea and a good understanding of what's already taking place. Um, and I'm, it's, it's bringing up uh, questions in my mind, and I'm sure other folks um, are curious uh, and would like to you know, dive a little deeper into that. Um, why don't we, uh, well, here, how about, maybe we can um, throw a few questions at Aaron before uh, jumping over to Brian's uh, presentation. So, um, yeah, that was really interesting about the emissions reductions, uh, you know, since we're trying to get a handle on what this means for NMU and how they can help get to carbon neutrality. Um, but uh, I guess since you're already handling some of the food waste that Northern has, um, could you go over like where, what portion of the food waste do you think that you guys get from them out of what they generate? And like, is this the, 
the kitchen scraps like before it gets um served and like from what how many of the locations at northern or and how much do you think is out there that you aren't collecting from northern well right now we are collecting the food waste from tamaki and tea um northern center the starbucks and the jam rich building and northern lights dining and this is all pre-consumer waste it's from the kitchen it just scraps and and when when uh north when the northern center has its catering service i think they're pretty down in business right now because of covid but we get a lot of the leftover food that people didn't eat um if they couldn't find a way to repurpose it and give it to anyone in need um we take that uh i talked to alan griefus about the taking the sounds like post-consumer food waste from Northern Lights uh, Dining Center. And she said there's a centrifuge and a pulper, but because of COVID, they don't wanna mess around with the uh, post-consumer food waste at this moment. But it sounds like that's gonna be quite a large volume. And I think I was told it'd probably fill the back of our pickup truck at least once a week. So I'd probably, I'm estimating it maybe like 500 gallons a week. Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to talk to them more about that. Okay, that's interesting. So it's, it's uh, not that it isn't an option, it's just um, you're kind of building up and you've got this new truck and trailer and you haven't quite, quite gotten there yet. But it's, uh, it sounds like it's a different product though. Are you going to have to modify your mixing or your... your um, you know, ingredients in the mix, if it's this, you know, cooked, uh, you said you took, you taken some of that already, but if it's like this centrifuge product, um, are you going to have to adjust your mix somehow? How would that go? Well, the food waste, uh, that's coming from, that will be coming from the cafeteria eventually. Um, it sounds like they run it through a centrifuge to remove the liquid and make it lighter and then a pulper and that kind of shreds it up, macerates the food waste. Uh, I don't think we'll really have to do anything different. We can just mix that right into our, our current windrow and use the same process. It's it's still uh, still organic waste, it's food waste. I'm guessing there might be paper materials in there, which that's no problem. It just, uh, we have the capacity to pick up that waste. It's just waiting for the university to, you know, reach uh, full capacity with their dining service operations. And so um, eventually, do you foresee uh, Partridge Creek Farm being capable of handling all the waste that comes from Northern's different locations? Um, yeah. I'd, we have, right now our site's one acre, we can expand up to maybe 10 to 15 acres. And I think we could be big enough to be, I think we could start taking municipal organic waste instead of sending it to the landfill. I know they, I know Brad Austin at the Market Salt Waste Authority, um, he said they're trying to develop their own compost and project, but it is very hard to make it cost effective to collect organic waste and make a high quality product. So I think uh, as a nonprofit company um, with a lot of different programs that are an end use for our compost, I think we could develop a, a business model to take larger quantities of waste from like cities. I know there's talk of how Northern could help uh, the city of Marquette with organic waste collection. I have some students reaching out to me about that. And I think you said in the email something about that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And maybe that's a good um, transition over to Brian. Uh, he's got uh, experience on the large scale end of, end of these systems. So um i'll introduce uh brian jaros or is it brian jarosi um jaros that's right <laughs> okay so uh brian jaros is uh the co-founder and the president of agrilab technologies 
Um, and that's AgriLab, one word with a small l, uh, not to be confused with AgriLabs, um, which is uh, a totally different uh, business. So AgriLab Technologies is located in Vermont and they are a uh, large scale compost system engineer and installer. And they've spread to multiple states, including uh, Michigan, they've got a system installed. And the big uh, difference with their systems is that um, it's a no turn system, uh, but instead of using worms to compost the organics, uh, they draw air through the pile and then they actually capture the hot air. So um, without further ado, I'll let Brian get into that. Thanks, John, and thanks, Aaron. I'll uh, share my screen and uh, be able to show off some, some aspects of it. Uh, let me know when that, that comes in. Yep, we've got the... The window, except, uh, if, yeah, blow, go ahead and blow it up for us. Great. So I just started this one to describe the, the process. So um, you've got your compost pile, uh, similar to what was seen in the other, other slides, but these perhaps might be a little bigger, as big as eight feet tall and eight, 14 or 18 feet wide. Uh, and we use either pipes or aeration trenches under these piles so that we can push and pull air and the vapor using our mechanical unit. And we put an aeration blower and a bunch of uh, controlled valves so that we can either pull or push air and vapor out of different sections uh, or windrows or batches of a compost pile. Um, right in the middle of this mechanical unit is a specialized heat exchanger. So that vapor, uh, as you're aware, might be as hot as 150 degrees in a big hot compost, act, active compost pile. And we pull that through negative aeration through this specialized heat exchanger. And in addition to pulling oxygen and accelerating uh, the composting process, pulling that hot vapor across the heat exchanger is very similar to generating renewable solar thermal or geothermal energy. So we're more or less biothermal and we're able to capture that in a, a water and glycol loop. So just like solar thermal panels up on a roof would then circulate into your plumbing system, uh, that's more or less what this uh, image at the left goes to. So it can go into barns, uh, it can heat floors, or heat greenhouses, or the process hot water would be something like wash water. Uh, so uh, on a dairy farm, lots of water consumption. Some of the bigger municipal facilities are now washing totes or trailers after handling food scraps. And then we also send some of this energy at some sites to a second exchanger to heat air and dry down the finished compost before it either gets run through a screener or stored in bags or drive moisture off before it's stored or trucked away. So uh, <clears throat> I started with that one. Um, I'm gonna run through a, just a handful of slides quickly just so um, it can also describe um, kind of how we got to this point. So uh, men, while I got to work with a, a mixture of um, farm-based and uh, municipal materials like food scraps and leaves when I got into composting uh, right at the end of my own college in uh, New York State. Uh, most of the work with AgriLab Technologies has been with dairy farms or other livestock farms initially. So this particular farm was down in, is down in Northern Connecticut and uh, they've had a long-standing uh, composting facility that they exclusively turned with loaders. So um, the older uh, family member, Jack, who's, who's shown in this, in the blue shirt, he reported that he would spend over a thousand hours a year sometimes in his loader, flipping over a mixture of their uh, own dairy manure, but also leaves and wood chips that they got in from the local community, and uh, one of the fairgrounds that was nearby in Southern Massachusetts. 
Um, so they would use some of it on their own fields for crop production, but they also had a, a compost business where they would sell this. Um, <clears throat> the process doing the turned windrows uh, took one to two years for them. So the big thing that we wanted to do is uh, install this aeration system to accelerate the process. Um, so if you could picture those windrows before, the outside of the pile um, is exposed to the air and gets oxygen and helps it break down aerobically. But at the center of the pile, uh, if it's active materials, it can run out of oxygen and the composting process tends to slow down or stall uh, in as little as an hour in that core until that pile is flipped with a bobcat or a loader or some other turning a device. And then you get a flush of activity, um, temperatures would increase again and then you'd uh, see it slow down again as the microbes in the pile consume that oxygen and, and the pr process continues. Uh, so by introducing aeration into these piles, uh, again, through either pushing positive aeration or pulling negative aeration, it's keeping more oxygen in there. Um, so on an efficiency level, it's gonna speed up the process. It also uh, keeps it aerobic and avoids methane um, emissions from the pile. So when you go into uh, anaerobic uh, environment, um, you start to release methane from the piles. So um, work with the U University of New Hampshire we've done over time, documents when you keep these manure compost and other types of compost piles well oxygenated, you can eliminate methane emissions. Uh, so just to show a couple more images, um, the range of sites that we've done are what I would call range from frugal Yankee farmer, where we work very closely with the farmer and um, our teams build the system with them. In this case, uh, just a gravel pad with concrete blocks. And then the piping is um, these heavy duty HDPE high density polyethylene pipes with uh, perforation holes in them that get buried under the compost. So this is the cheapest approach, avoids a lot of concrete um, slabs, um, the cost of a building cover. And then once filled, um, you can see the, the just the tips of the pipe ends are, are covered with some coarse wood chips at the bottom to help distribute the air. And then the mixtures of dairy manure and and the leaves and other material they get are put on top. Um, so that material, again, it, we're, we're sucking primarily out of those piles. And then you can see this material stacked up. And, and then at the, at the equipment, we're able to track everything from the temperature. Uh, we can confirm that we're at least getting 131 degrees Fahrenheit to, to kill potential pathogens and weed seeds. Uh, we're able to track the oxygen levels, uh, very low oxygen levels here at the start of a composting cycle. So you're, you're kind of pulling the dead air out of the compost and eventually we try to get that up over 10%. We're able to track the um, flow rate of the vapor so that we know that we're in fact are aerating and, and getting air through it and there's not a water blockage or other obstruction. Uh, and then we also track the water uh, temperatures going in and out in the flow. So that's how we can uh, keep track of how it's going inside and outside of the process. So one of the unique things we do is again, combining that aeration with heat recovery and the heat recovery at this particular farm was a mixture of heating up, preheating the wash water, um, a space heater in their barn, uh, the bigger savings were associated with the reduced labor. We, acceler um, we anticipated that we accelerated their compost sales revenue by over $20,000. Um, the uh, changing, and they saved 400 hours of labor on that big payloader. So between the labor of the farmer and the diesel costs, there was an additional 20,000 of savings. And then um, the heat limit, the heat savings from the recovery were actually fairly modest at this site because their loads uh, didn't exceed how much energy we were producing. Um, but so that's, that's part of it. Um, 
other site in Massachusetts we got to work with. This is out in Western Mass, uh, Winchenden, so dairy farm and uh, on-farm cheese maker. So some quick slides of how we adjusted their existing site, um, put in these air, larger aeration pipes, brought in one of our skid mounted aeration units, the aeration and heat recovery, and uh, put in new larger piping. Um, primarily what, what it's done is it's um, been able to allow them to extend their operation uh, through more of the winter uh, months. It's allowed them to have this building that used to just be overflowing with material now uh, be ready months earlier than it used to and improve their spring compost sales volumes and revenues. Uh, how they used most of the heat was actually at the at the end of the process. Um, you picture compost at the end uh, when it's getting towards mature is, is like a sponge. Um, so if it isn't dried out well, um, you might be able to see in the background that um, circular device, which is a screen and a conveyor coming off of it. Their material was so wet, they, they couldn't even get it through the screen without three passes. So by redirecting the heat from the system onto a forced air of, of heated air at the end of the process, you can see all the steam coming off of the piles. We were able to dry down that material and it saved cut down the um, production time to a third of what it was for their screening. So it was a real labor saving, which again saves uh, diesel and in the process as well and help the overall viability of the farm. Again, we're tracking the temperature. Here we're able to 155 degrees, the oxygen levels flow. And then on the water side, the, the water temps in and out and our flow rate. Um, so we're able to be up here in Northern Vermont sitting on a dirt road and uh, be keeping track of what's going on in um, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and uh, some of these other locations um, I've got listed here. So I will quickly switch to what I think is pretty exciting because uh, John mentioned our uh, project in Michigan. So um, this is down in Burton, just uh, across the street from part of Flint. And again, to picture how we get the aeration in under these piles in a bigger operation where you're using loaders or other equipment, uh, I just wanted to point out the aeration trenches. So rather than those pipes that are sitting on grade and had to be straddled or otherwise avoided with the loader, um, you can see in the foreground here, these concrete trenches where we put the pipes in. Um, and then we connect the pipes, we insulate them to keep all that vapor hot. And our equipment, instead of being on one of those frame metal skids, we mounted uh, two of those units inside this 20 foot shipping container. And uh, we built and assembled it here in Vermont and uh, shipped it out to, to Country Oaks Landscape Supply. So I'll go through some of these pictures quickly, but just to illustrate that's, that's uh, as the construction process was going in about a year and a half ago, um, these trenches and a, and a new pad was, was put together. Um, these are the aeration pipes that ultimately um, go through a sump. So any of the liquids that could either drain through the compost pile or the condensate that forms when you get all that hot vapor running against the relatively cooler walls or the concrete or the pipes uh, could form a water block. So we have kind of exaggerated sink traps um, partway in the system before it, the aeration pipes get connected into the equipment. Um, so if there's a view of the pad in construction, uh, you can kind of see that the working pad has been brought up to the level of those trenches. And uh, again, the will suck out from on the pad through the sump, through those 90 degree pipes and into the equipment. Um, we fill those trenches with chips so that it doesn't get all packed in with that wet clumpy compost. Um, kind of looking at it from that way. And then here's inside. So that again, this here's the equipment on the inside, that green unit with the uh, yellow motor 
is the aeration fan. So that's the big vacuum or suction that's put on it. Um, through controlling valves, um, we are able to primarily pull, but also push air into the piles. So that also accelerates the process, being able to push air both ways. And then the hoses coming off that are running through the heat exchanger. So again, this can, we've even heated the fluid up over 160 degrees. And then this fluid is uh, run underground about uh, 250 feet or so to their uh, shop and sales building and where they have a radiant floor. And uh, it cut down their previous consumption of, of uh, natural gas in that building, something like 90%. So we, we really changed, uh, we were able to almost exclusively heat their, their building uh, from renewable energy out of compost rather than natural gas. Again, similar control screen, we're able to track, you know, we're aerating for 35 minutes on zone one, and then there's eight piles out there. Uh, we can go to zone two for another, and we, we it change both the, uh, length of aeration and the fan power, depending if it's uh, early in the process when there's a lot of oxygen demand, we'll run it really hard or for a long stretch. Um, and then as it matures, there's less need for um, oxygen and we can keep track of uh, not overcooling it and shorten the uh, aeration cycles and the, the, and the, the uh, fan power used. Uh, just so, I, I like this to go through this slide just because it shows what happens when you've got a pile that's sitting there um, unaerated or static, and then you move it into the aeration mode. So that this this larger line here is the temperature graph. So it's the it shows that it within a matter of uh, 20 minutes or so, we're able to bring that vapor temperature coming through the pipe into the equipment from 75 up to around 140. And likewise, this lower line is the oxygen level. So oxygen is depleted as the pile sits there static. And then over a 20 or 25 minute aeration cycle, you can see the oxygen levels come up. So this, this guides how we change our settings. Um, we work with the, the operators at the site um, and they make the changes after we've trained them or in some cases we get hired. And uh, again, I can, sit here uh, from my home office or at our shop and um, make changes to settings uh, in these different places. So uh, it's pretty cool what you can do through the internet these days. <laughs> uh, I like this shot too, because uh, this is February a year ago and uh, the system is now loaded. Um, there's eight different batches on the working pad. And even though they're covered with snow on the outside, um, the vast majority of the pile is is still very warm. You kind of have an insulated or a cold layer on the outside of the pile, but we were still bringing in 150 degree vapor um, out of the cores of those piles through those trenches and those insulated pipes uh, up into up into the equipment and to the heat exchanger. Um, and there, here's our happy, <laughs> satisfied Mark Cherry. He did some really hired a, a cool artist uh, to uh, add some artwork to our otherwise boring shipping container. And uh, uh, I know the Michigan Recycling Coalition got mentioned earlier. They actually did a virtual tour of their site um, for the, the virtual version of the conference this year. So Mark and uh, Amy Freeman, who's been working on composting issues for a long time, uh, kind of go through the site and uh, talk about some of our aeration system, but all their other operations at the site. So if you ever check out Country Oaks Landscape Supply or our site, um, you can you can get to those links. Um, I will mention also that one of the, beyond the efficiency and the energy, uh, renewable thermal energy aspects of this is their odor issue was from grass clippings. They, uh, part of their business is taking in all these lush fresh grass, grass clippings during the summer growing season. And uh, they de decompose really quickly and release a lot of ammonia and kind of nitrogen rich. Uh, so it's a combination of, of not having the fully right recipe, enough carbon to nitrogen. Uh, but a lot of it is they just couldn't get enough air to it when they were trying to turn the piles multiple times a week 
and they just would run out of oxygen and they were having some odor issues with neighbors in the municipality. And uh, in 2020, after our installation, they had zero complaints. So, um, so it is to try to tie it back into what John uh, introduced me to in terms of the opportunities in Marquette and potentially biosolids and food scraps and other things. Um, part of the issue with reluctance for some communities to adopt composting is the concerns about odor. Um, so there are, just to say that there are effective strategies out there. They're usually multi-pronged approaches, uh, but one piece of it is, is, is making sure the compost process stays aerobic and you can avoid a lot of those offensive odors. So uh, I will stop sharing and um, hopefully uh, help illustrate some of what we do and um, love to think, apply it to, to what some of your ideas that you had locally. All right, thanks a lot, Brian. Yeah, that was really enlightening. So uh, kind of a high tech version of it um, where you're, you're using electricity rather than the diesel with the front end loader coming in and stirring it, you're powering and, and that electricity could come from solar like um, the discussion last night talked about. So it's, it's quite a bit easier to, uh, you know, make a renewable power as electricity rather than replacing a liquid fuel for the, the turning of it. But then also um, the advantage of not going through and once in a while turning it um, and instead like continually giving it just enough oxygen is, is it doesn't have those, those um, cycles where, you know, all of a sudden it's got a bunch of oxygen but then when it's deficient in oxygen, it's, it's releasing methane. Um, I do have a graphic to show uh, about what that um, place down in, in lower Michigan was doing before they switched over. So this is their farm. Uh, you can see in the background behind this machine, I think that's a bunch of those bagged leaves. So they're taking um, you know, stuff that people have on the curb like you see in Marquette in the fall and in the spring, those bag leaves a lot of times, um, and and they're composting that. So this was their their tumbler or their turner that they would run over the rows with, and I think they were doing that a couple times a week. But um, you can see that uh, there's a lot of steam being let off, and uh, so that's the heat. But also it's those smells, it's those. Um, the ammonia, I suppose, uh, some methane that might be trapped in there. But then after it, after it, um, you know, settles down and is no longer aerated before they run over it again, it's gotten into an anaerobic state and is releasing some methane. Um, and so you've got the diesel expense, the labor, like you pointed out, and the loss in heat and this additional pollution from ammonia. Um, You've got odors. And Brian, I guess if you could touch on the odor control and especially how you can use a biofilter in a productive way that it's capturing the odor, but also um, you're releasing some CO2 uh, for plants to utilize in like a hoop house scenario. Um, I think folks would be really interested in that. Sure. So, um... Yeah, that's a great shot to show because that steam that's coming off, in fact, is, um, you know, in most compost operations, that's just going off to the air and, and not being utilized. Uh, and instead, we're able to draw that through the pipe network and into the system um, probably 10 or 12 times a day for each of those piles. Um, but that's a good visual representation. So the the biofilter that John described um, is typically a wood chip based um, bed that's able to um, receive the exhaust at the end of the, after the blower sucks through from the original pile. So uh, you can imagine uh, at times, whether it's at the beginning of the process or if there was too little carbon in your 
in your mixture, uh, you could have offensive odors that are like ammonia or rich or, or even more sulfur and um, rotten egg type odor. So it depends on how the conditions of the pile are and what its recipe is. Uh, but because of this um, more urban setting, we, uh, we've created this like three foot deep bed. I, I don't have a picture of it handy in front of me, but the exhaust pipes go into these um, beds. The PVC pipes are at the bottom and then the air and the vapor releases goes up that through that three feet of uh, wood chips and it, it smells like mulch rather than um, overripe grass clippings or, or something worse. Uh, what a couple sites had done previously on farms was to try to use that residual exhaust both for heat and for the CO2 enrichment for plant growth. Um, the earlier sites in Vermont and Massachusetts had done it kind of on a do-it-yourself basis without a lot of uh, monitoring or data associated with it. Um, one of the cool things that uh, Mark Cherry and the Country Oaks team is doing is they built a greenhouse uh, this winter and they're getting set up to utilize uh, the extra energy that they had available from the compost aeration and heat recovery system, but then also use that residual energy and CO2. So they're they're developing additional ductwork um, to pull off that biofilter bed and draw that into the adjacent uh, greenhouse. So it's more or less air to air heating at that point. There's there's no additional mechanical exchangers or things of that nature. Um, and then the CO2, they'll, they'll put a um, CO2 sensor in the greenhouse so that they can see at what levels. I, I believe 1500 parts per million is, is what some greenhouse growers like to have as a level for increasing crop production. So one of the valid concerns is um, the exhaust that you get off a compost pile isn't consistent. You know, it's, it's variable both um, over a month period, you know, that initial raw mix is not going to smell like perfect compost and just be carbon dioxide and water vapor um, like it will be a week or, or three weeks into the process. And then as you were able to see from that graph, there's also a change in the emissions, uh, even from the half an hour of an aeration cycle. So with a fresh mix, you could start down at 1% oxygen um, and some of the, there may be NH3 uh, and small lower levels of ammonia or even uh, hydrogen sulfide. So things that aren't necessarily um, healthy for humans or plants or anything and highly corrosive. So what we're using for, because of the oxygen sensors is uh, basically, it's additional level of controls, but you'd have to make sure that you get up to an adequate oxygen level, 5% or higher um, before exhausting it into the greenhouse. So you just continue to exhaust it um, to the biofilter and um, to the atmosphere um, in a dispersed environment rather than um, just putting it into an enclosed space of a greenhouse. So they're kind of a front end control to only vent it in when you've got oxygen, adequate oxygen and then um, also have additional means of ventilating the greenhouse if the levels ever get too high. So it's, it's a little more involved, but a, um, it's a way to just keep on stacking, uh, being a more aggressive scavenger. You're, you're just trying to harvest every possible resource out of this compost. You, you know, it's starting with avoiding it from landfilling to, you know, putting it in a form that can go back into the soil, but then even all these other, the thermal energy, the CO2 and and who now? Who knows what else we'll get out of squeeze out of compost in the in the years to come? But uh, that that's the concept, and um, I I forget how far in hours that is. Um, but um, to get down to Burton and Flint area, but it's uh, they're generally pretty open for people for visits um, between Mark and um, Amy Freeman on his team. 
Yeah, I think maybe we could get there in five to six hours if you drive fast. Uh, Aaron, if we could bring you back into the conversation, you mentioned how you have to bulk up the mixture from what you get at Northern. Um, when you, if, if it moves forward to where you're, you're getting quite a bit more food waste uh, from the, the post-consumer end of these cafeterias, uh, do you anticipate bringing in leaves like um, Brian mentioned or wood chips or, you know, is, is there a source of that on campus that you could take off their hands or where will you get that from? Um, I talked to North Country Disposal and they'd give us all their leaves in the fall. Um, I'm actually in contact with tree service companies um, and another project involving mycology and inoculate and uh, mulch with uh, mycelium so we have access to wood chips and uh, we can get a lot of carbon materials to mix with this stuff um, I think uh, eventually you know it's a lot easier to get carbon materials than it is nitrogen materials and I think we might have to go to a different kind of compost and um and that that was a question I had for Brian uh what happens in your system if primarily all the waste you can get is wood chips and uh, like leaves? And because that's mainly the kind of waste we have around here. We don't have many farms and we can get horse manure, but um, yeah, we're so yeah, we got plenty of carbon materials. <laughs> so it, I, I maybe you've seen that sticker compost happens. Um, it, it's still going to happen, but it'll go slower. So getting in that ideal 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen ratio um, is the optimum. And that's when the, the microbes are really going to take off and you've set up the best ecosystem for them and combine that with around that 60% moisture and sufficient oxygen, uh, you're going to get the best um, thermophilic conditions for, for mm -hmm. that type of composting to take off. So it'll, it'll still happen. Um, if you can get some of the green, more green materials, some of those same um, plants in the summertime, um, grass clippings, again, I mentioned is something that might be locally available. Um, if you're doing gardening, at least be a little uh, concerned or inquire to the source of the grass clippings that they're not treated and so forth with uh, persistent herbicides. Um, but then scavenging for more food scraps or um, I don't know if you have any food processors in your in your region or if you're more of a forestry region for the most part. Um, but if they're uh, cherries are probably more of a an e eastern or a western Michigan thing I, I would assume. Mm -hmm. um, but there's probably other uh, scraps in the community um, to get some some nitrogen in. Yeah, I uh, think the, the bio scraps. biosolids was the other thing. Mm -hmm. I know, John, you've you've looked at with your your research. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and we can touch in on that um, if time allows. Uh, we do have another question from the audience um, about how the the worms overwinter up here. Uh, it seems like the, the piles um, that Brian was describing do quite well, even in a northern climate like this. But um, when you're doing the vermicomposting, are there certain precautions that you have to take to ensure their survival? Well, we cover our windrows with about a foot of hay, and that keeps the heat in there. And uh, going back, uh, like this winter, we built about a row every two months. And that first active row, that's about a hundred feet long. It was generating enough heat that it was, it kept melting the snow off the top and you pull back that hay and there's a bunch of worms underneath. Um, the older rows that were built months ago, um, I mean, it, it took about until midwinter before the snow started to accumulate on them. And then they kind of started the freeze. And by that time, the thermophilic, um, um, compost and it slowed down and it's pretty much the worms just down there colonizing the piles and uh, 
the worms are pretty resilient. Uh, even on some of the piles that stir the freeze on the top, under that frozen layer, they're right below it. And uh, I think they've adapted to the climate. Also, I mean, they, they reproduce incredibly fast. They probably evolve very quickly. That's interesting. So we've got some cold, hardy worms up here um, <laughs> after, after all this, uh, all this vermicomposting. Um, they're, pretty, they're pretty savvy. They can find a, a zone that, that meets their needs somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, if we wanted to touch on the um, issue of biosolids. So uh, I kind of came into this um, after learning about the Ishpeming wastewater treatment plant. They, instead of using, um, you know, fancy equipment, I mean, there is some of that involved, but uh, they have um, a composting system to treat their wastewater, their sewage. Um, and so it's an, it's an aerobic process and they used a, a company that um, I've been in touch with called Engineered Compost Solutions, ECS out of Seattle, I wanna say. Um, and so they, they compost their, their sewage sludge, essentially their biosolids um, aerobically with wood chips that they're bringing in off of forestry jobs. So it's like the chipped limbs and tops off of uh, these jobs and they're they're paying for that so it's not um, quite a waste product but it sounds like uh, RN that that you can get plenty of that um, that material uh, I I do know that the Marquette wastewater treatment plant um, is expanding right now and they're taking in new materials to treat through their anaerobic system which um, they use, it's a lack of oxygen. And so they, they are encouraging uh, methane production in, in their system, which then they capture and uh, burn that methane through um, a combined heat and power plant to power their facility and to heat their, their system. But um, this increase in production that they're gonna have uh, due to taking in more material to treat is going to result in an increased output of biosolids for fertilizer. So they currently um, deliver to farms uh, these kind of used up biosolids. So there's no carbon really left in them at all. Mm. Um, and so if you're talking a nitrogen content, like you're looking for, you know, that one part to match with your your um, 30 parts carbon, that could be a source that could be delivered, but maybe Brian could touch on, you know, once, once they've gone through that anaerobic process and all the volatiles are, are burned up off of that um, sewage, is that uh, gonna be a viable source for um, nitrogen in this kind of system? It will be different for sure. It's got, uh, like you mentioned, it's gonna have less carbon um, and there may be some nitrogen loss as well, depending on the treatment process. So uh, it, it would need to be sampled to know the value of it. Um, you typically would wanna sample everything from carbon and nitrogen to its moisture content, its pH. Um, other information is helpful, but those would probably be some of the most important parameters. Um, maybe the other one would be its bulk density, um, like how, how dense it is, how, how many pounds per cubic yard. Um, so that way you can uh, think through what are the proportions of materials that you want for um, dry matter to get it to that, again, approximately 60% starting moisture content. Uh, but then to get it to a bulk density that's maybe somewhere around a thousand pounds per cubic yard, roughly uh, two cubic yards per ton. Um, and that way it's, it's fluffy enough for there to be some air, small air pockets within the pile. Um, but then again, also the, the carbon and nitrogen. So the carbon being, being the food for those microbes, that's their, their sugar, their energy. Um, and then the nitrogen being the building blocks for proteins and, and the cells. So um, 
and that 30 to one, you think about it um, while you're, you're trying to assess it for an entire pile, um, where the action happens is literally the surface of those particles. So it's a, it's a series of those connections making all those conditions. So it's not like the pile all decomposes at once. It, it takes time because those pile settles and those interactions happen over time. The wood chip breaks down. So um, you've got to got to kind of think like the inside of a compost pile and it'll it'll happen. Well, and, and if you do have to blend these materials and make kind of a, um, a texture out of it, like, a, uh, you know, coat these these things evenly, um, it seems like maybe uh, just a bobcat or, or something simple might not do quite as good a job. Is there, um, you know, a tool that uh, some of these larger operations invest in to where you're like loading like one one scoop of this, a couple scoops of that, and it like throws it out into this windrow or what are they doing? Yeah, all of the above. It's still fairly common for people to use a, a loader bucket and kind of pull and drag and push against a, a buck wall or, you know, a block wall. Um, but there are things that uh, are often right out of the dairy industry, like the the same, they're called total mix ration mixers, um, but they have like augers and a big um, hopper where you, they, on a farm, they'd be mixing together silage and grain and minerals to make a food recipe. But uh, essentially the same equipment, some of the same companies make for blending in food scraps, leaves, wood chips. And that way you can make your recipe and your formulation to hit all those targets. So um, yeah, absolutely. There's, there's companies out there that do ones that are stationary and just sit in one place, or they have ones that are either on trucks or on, on tractor pulled wagons, and then you can mix it and bring it out to the windrow. Um, so yeah, absolutely. You get a much more homogenous mix of, of all those materials and, and you're making those, you know, connections of carbon and nitrogen better. And with an aeration system, that's even more important because um, air will move through the path of least resistance. So if you have a, a pocket of very um, fluffy or less dense material, air will preferentially pull through that area and then not necessarily get aeration to that compressed dense area of the pile. So, um, so that upfront blending is um, a particularly important step in a aeration mix where you're not going to continue to turn it or agitate it during the composting cycle. All right, great. And I have also seen where um, a manure spreader is utilized. Uh, yep. the, those TMR machines, the total mix ration, I think they're running on a hundred horsepower um, tractor. Uh, oh yeah. But, but a manure spreader, I mean, I've used just a little like Ferguson or like a TO20 or a um, little uh, Ford 9N or something and pulling just a PTO driven uh, manure spreader. And that, that could be a cheap option to go to um, just on a smaller scale. Maybe uh, if, if Partridge Creek Farm is looking to upgrade just a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I see that we're at time. So I, I want to thank you guys, uh, Brian Jarose and Aaron Yoki, Aaron um, from, uh, from AgriLab Technologies and Partridge Creek Farm respectively for coming in and presenting to us. This has been really great. And we hope that uh, we can pass this along to administrators and decision makers at NMU to try to advance this um, discussion around how we can uh, utilize composting to meet some of NMU's goals. So thanks a bunch and thanks everybody for joining. Yep, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Happy, happy Earth Day. <laughs> yes, happy Earth Day to you too. Great to have you here. Bye-bye. All right. Have a good evening. Yep, you too. Bye-bye. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Yep, no problem.